Hello everybody, welcome. Here we are with Rain from MiamiFruit.com and we are at this amazing, amazing farm and he's going to tell us a little about the history and the vision of this farm and then we're going to see some of the trees here. So uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yes. So how many acres do you have here? So our farm at Miami Fruit is seven and a half acres. The uh, first two and a half is where we started and it's Bill Lassard's old farm, who Bill Lassard was a tropical fruit legend here and he wrote the book on bananas and you know brought all these cool bananas to uh, South Florida along with tons, countless other uh, tropical fruit. He's named a lot. So he um, mentored us, took me under his wing and gave us you know a, an insight and taught us um, you know a lot about tropical fruit and and also inspired us to to push the envelope push the boundaries and try new things so here at, at our farm we are dedicated to trialing new species seeing what's possible in our changing climate and uh, and also finding crops that are going to be more economical for growers in this economy to to dedicate their time to growing and to actually be able to st sustain their farms with now, your company, Miami Fruit, uh, helps people all around the country get all this tropical fruit that people normally couldn't get, right? Yes, yes. So, MiamiFruit.org is, is a, a place where people can order the highest quality and the most diverse variety of tropical fruits. Um, check it out. We have everything. We've been doing it longer than anybody. And, um, you know, if there's, if there's something to be found, you'll find it there. And so diversity is really our main focus. Very good. Very good. And I know there's a lot of uh, people that get fruit from you here. Uh, can you uh, talk about some of the different types of trees you have here that people might not be, be aware well, of? Well, um, well, we, yeah, we have here at this farm, we are trying new things. So we have hundreds of different varieties here. But not all of them are going to produce. So we are throwing darts at the wall, seeing what's going to stick, trying things that either have never been tried before in this area, or um, haven't been tried in a long enough time that we, you know, we don't get the quake as much cold as we used to, and we might be able to get away with. So um, we're we're trying, you know, new things. But um, but what's on the website? Things that are different that we that we sell, you know, stuff like um, all the exotic rare bananas that we have, the mamesa pote, the tropical persimmon, abiu, ice cream bean, um, the list goes on. There's, you know, hundreds of products on there and, um, you know, we, we, we strive to offer even more every year. Now, how much of a percentage of the fruit that you grow here versus that you get from uh, local farmers? Uh, do you, well, how, do you, how do you work? You work? So, so most of our fruit comes from local farmers and farmers across the seas. So certain things like our, our tree ripened, tree fallen Malaysian durian, we're just never quite going to get away with it here, or at least we haven't figured out how. Um, you know, soursop is one that we bring in from a grower in Grenada that we have a tight relationship with. We can grow soursop here, but only about half of the year. And even then we have problems with it. Um, so, you know, there, our climate does restrict us in a way. However, uh, we have the, the best climate in the continental U.S. to grow this stuff, you know. Granted, the Keys might be a little, little bit better, but there's no land left there. <laughs> so we have the only place here in, in Homestead in South Florida that we can grow really, really tropical things and get away with them. Um, and that's what, we're, what, that's what we're trialing here. So actually every year we're producing more exotic stuff like Rolinia we have now producing and on the website, but we are actually taking out old trees that we, that we don't need the fruit for, like avocados. So we'll replace avocados systematically with newer crops that we've proven that will work. What do you do with the trees you take out? Oh, we mulch them. Oh, yeah. really? Oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, I mean, they're too big to transplant. Sure, sure. Yeah. So what I like about what you're doing here is you're very, you have a great internet presence. Everyone check out their website. I love the list you have of what fruits are in season and when. But what I really like what you do is there are people that have helped farms for many, many years. Mm -hmm. They're old. They wouldn't know the internet if it hit them in the head. And they have all this amazing fruit, but they don't have any way to get it out to the world. Right. So you work with them and help them right. uh, we get have, it out to the world. We have hundreds of growers. I mean, probably thousands of growers. And, and you know, our goal is to, is to try to um, improve the supply chain, especially for tropical fruit, which doesn't have a great shelf life. 
So, you know, the example I always give people is like a typical supply chain would go from a grower to a packer to a wholesaler to a distributor and get trucked across the country. Um, that could take weeks. And then once it gets to, say, New York or Chicago or California, it sits there in the wholesaler and gets distributed to a retailer. And then the retailer holds it for a few days or a week. And then by the time you're eating a dragon fruit from Homestead, it could be almost a month old and it tastes like water. So we pick the fruit and we put it in a box and the customer gets it the next day and there's flavor and there's nutrients. We get to harvest it when it's ripe. That's the beauty of what we're doing is, is quality control, um, delivering the best product possible to the customer and then paying higher prices than normal in most cases for the grower. So we can cut out a bunch of steps that actually are detrimental to the value of the product. Sure, wonderful. Well, this place is amazing, and I know you have a future projects that you're working on helping uh, current growers to keep uh, their land and property in, in business. Yes. So t yes. tell us a little about that. So, so um, that's kind of the probably what I feel is the most beneficial to your audience because I'm sure a lot of them know about us or have ordered from us. Um, here in South Florida, we are dealing with a. a competitive market, the fruit market, which most of the fruit in the U.S. is coming from other countries where the cost of production is much cheaper than here. Um, in Right now in 2022, uh, in Homestead, it costs anywhere from 100000 to 300000 per acre of land, bare land, to, to purchase. Um, that's farmland. Um, if you want to set up a farm in, say, Ecuador, where a lot of the produce in the U.S. is grown, um, the land might cost $500 to an acre, or maybe a thousand, um, and the cost of labor might cost a dollar or two a day per person. You know, here we're talking about hundreds of dollars a day per person in labor, and fuel um, is a fraction of the cost that it is here. So if you take a pineapple at the store that was grown in Ecuador, the cost that went into that is orders of magnitude less than the pineapple we grow here. Um, so our goal with this farm and this project is to trial new species, to create niche and um, specialty items that won't be possible in a typical supply chain or to grow and and produce at volume from another country that has lower cost of production. So our in essence our goal is to is to offer growers a high value crop that they can grow so that in 20 years in Homestead there's still some agriculture going on, there's still people growing fruit because growing avocados for 20 cents a pound wholesale isn't going to cut it. Um, so we're trialing hundreds of species and uh, we hope that uh, very soon we'll have results and we can work hand in hand with growers to offer them crops that we can buy for high high margins. And how do you learn personally how to grow these trees and everything besides Blue Lizard? Did you, did you know before that? Did you grow up with this or was this something he showed you? Um, I've always been around plants. My, my father uh, grows plants. Uh, not you know, He grows fruit as well but more um, you know palms and, and stuff like that. So I've grown up around it but I think with farming, um, and you could probably agree, you're always learning, and uh, it, everything is zone specific. So you learn something here, and you go to the west coast of Florida, you're going to have to relearn a whole bunch. Um, but the one thing that's true about farming is, if you can learn how to learn and be adaptive, then you'll succeed when you're faced with challenges. So I'm hoping that uh, I'm learning how to learn here, and we're we're doing a good job. So. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Can you show us around some of your favorite trees? Well, we can show you around, yes. And some of the trees, um, we we don't want to disclose the varietal names. And some of them actually don't have names yet. Um, and the reason for this is that when we do uh, have, our, when we are at the point that we can produce these plants for our growers to, to start production on a large scale, say five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, um, that information is going to be uh, secret and it's going to be classified to the grower. So the grower is going to have an exclusive crop that no other grower will have, at least not from me, at least not from, from this video. And that way, uh, for the first few years of production, 
we should be able to ensure and guarantee a high profit for that crop and it should be able to pay the bills and pay for the years of work that went into producing those first few years of crop. Wonderful, so. wonderful. And uh, so there's some things here that are existing still and some things you got rid of and replaced. Yes. So how old are the things here that were existing already? Um, well, it varies. You know, we have, uh, so this farm I think we got in 2017 and then this parcel which we'll see over there we got uh, just a year ago. Um, and um, yeah, so there are some trees here that are 20, 30 years old. There are probably more. And then there are some trees producing that are only two or three years old. So, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, show us what you got. All right, let's walk around. All right, what's your favorite fruit? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, it depends on what's in season. <laughs> Come yeah. on, it's got to be durian, right? <laughs> I, I do like yeah. durian, and, and we do have the best durian. Uh, we have right now, I think, eight or nine varieties of durian. Wow, and you sell that on your website. And we sell all that on our website, yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is a wonderful, beautiful place here. Thank you. Do you have a lot of staff, or do you do most of the labor here? We have here? Um, about 20 to 30 people. Um, it's, it's tough to keep people around nowadays, and some people just don't show up for work. But, um, yeah, about 20 to 30 people. Uh, so these are, some, these are the trees that, that uh, were the reason we bought this property, the tropical persimmons. Um, and a lot of people will yell at me for calling them that, but that's what I call them. They're tropical persimmons, and um, they're just delicious. You have to wait till they're soft, and these trees are probably close to 30 years old, although every time I asked Bill, he gave me a different answer, but, um, but they grow very slowly, and, uh, and they produce very well here. So uh, you talk about the name. I have a tropical persimmon, then I had a, a Florida persimmon, and people say they're the same thing. And then, uh, I think the official name of this one is Triumph. Oh, so Triumph also. But, I have um, a Triumph persimmon. So they're all they're all pretty much the same. I don't know, but all I know is that this is the only persimmon I've ever tasted from uh, homestead soil. I don't think there's any other persimmon that fruits well here. Now, uh, some persimmons you have to eat when they're soft and some when you're hard. These are the ones you have to eat when they're soft, correct? Correct, yeah. Wonderful. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, mine's about this tall right <laughs> yeah. now. And, they grow uh, real slow. Yeah. And so after how many years? I heard they don't give fruit after, since you these are already here, you might not know. But I heard they don't give fruit after like four or five years, but then all of a sudden they go crazy. Do you know about that? I don't know about that. I yeah. don't know. Seriously. So, yeah, I don't have experience. So you haven't cut this back and it's 30 years old? Correct. Wow. Yeah. Well, and how many of these are on a the property? Uh, I think only two rows, maybe about 12 trees now. Okay. Yeah. And all of your all of your trees are on irrigation? Yes, everything's on irrigation. And, and I am by no means an expert, but what's worked for me over the past five years is doing a lot of irrigation in the winter and preparing the trees for a lot of rain in the summer. Um, because some, one problem we get with so much rain and so much water on the soil and on the roots that it can actually kill and damage the trees. Um, and if they're prepared for that by watering them a lot, then... Um, you know, then, then they seem to do all right. Do you use any uh, sprays on the trees or? Um, we do have some organic sprays, um, but we, we really are not focused on spraying because most of this farm is not for production. It's for experimentation and trialing the species. If we have proof of concept, then we can uh, offer this crop to the grower and then they can worry about, you know, the techniques and sprays they have to use. Because um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a large-scale professional farmer. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, and if our fruit is ugly and has a bit of spots on it, you know, it's no big deal. Our customers don't don't care about that, and so we don't, you know, we we don't worry about making things look really nice. Uh, you know, everyone prefers it to be sweet. Uh, these are uh, ice cream beans. Yes, ice cream beans. Yes, here's a small one. They're just growing now. And these trees get really big. Mm -hmm. So, was this tree here when you got the property? No, this one's two years old. Two years old. Look how yeah. big it is already. Wow. Yeah, we water a lot. Wow. Yeah. And, and ice cream beans, they just grow. <laughs> they just grow. What's all this growing here? Uh, those are abu flowers. 
Oh, Abu! Wow, look at yeah. this Abu tree. How this is, this had to have been here? Yes, this wow. one is probably. Well, it's it's pretty interesting because um, you know Bill planted these probably twenty years ago, maybe thirty years ago, um, and he's told me that they just took forever to grow. Um, now I'll show you over here. I have a tree that's been in the ground for one year, and it's almost this tall. Really? Wow. And uh, I think that just goes to show how much a little bit of cold can set back a tree and and keep it from growing. And if you have one or two years in the ground with not that much cold, um, they take off. So so this tree is full of flowers, and we're hoping we get a good crop on it. And over here, I'll show you a tree that's maybe two years old max, only one year in the ground. Um, and it's half Look the at size all those of flowers. Wow. Wow. And here's our two-year-old tree. Wow, that's and, two years old, wow. And it's loaded with fruit. How it, big was it when you planted it? Um, not very big at all. Wow. Just loaded with fruit. Wow. Not big at all. Look at it. Wow. And we water constantly. I have the irrigation on on these about five times a day. How many abu trees do you have? Um, handful. Uh, well, we have we have some. We we have a a, a good amount. <laughs> so, do you source your own trees with your own rootstock and your own grafting, or yes. do you buy them from other places? No, um, I like. I would prefer to buy them. Uh, however. When we when we got this parcel, or when we had plans to get this parcel, it was in the beginning stages of the pandemic, and there were no fruit trees available. I'd call Zills, and he'd say, "Sorry, we got nothing for you. Only existing customers." Um, you know, and, and there's just nothing really. There was no no trees available, so I started growing my own and grafting my own. I learned how to graft, and I've grafted like probably five thousand trees. Um, last season and we planted half of those um, that parcel has about 2,500 trees um, and so I still have a handful of trees that I'm that I'm you know selling and sharing with my friends um, so yeah that was difficult but I did you know we started our own little nursery just to supply ourselves with trees to grow um, and and it's been uh, it's been fun learning how to graft and learning how to do all this stuff but um, Definitely, I prefer to to buy it from the professionals. Yeah, what's this tree here? It looks uh, this one's an Abu too. Okay, so yeah. was that smaller than that when you first planted it? Um, I can't quite remember, but it probably was. They may just be two different seedlings. Um, these two are not grafted. I do have some grafted ones. So you have grafted Abu because I thought all Abu around was seedlings, but you have grafted. No, I do have some grafts oh, that I've done, wonderful. and and I don't think it's necessary. Um, but uh, we'll we'll have some results for you in a few years. So Abu is more true to seed for the most. I, I just think that um, there aren't that many varieties that are uh, that much better than a seedling that it's right. worth it. But you never know what you get with the seedling. So. so hey, you've been doing this a long time now. So is there any fruit? I mean, there's thousands of fruits around the world, but that you haven't tasted yet that you would like to. I'm, there's tons of fruit that I haven't tasted that I would like to. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what the names would be, but okay. um, I, if I had time, I would travel and, and try some of these fruits okay. for sure. But, but as for South Florida, you've tasted just about everything that grows down here in this climate, right? Um, well, I, I think I've tasted everything that, uh, that's around here growing, yeah. but I think we can grow a lot more than, than what people are growing. And I think we just need to find the right varieties and the right methods and and um, and get these trees in the ground, and and get a, get them get them going. You know, I, I don't think that we've even tapped half of the potential of what our climate's capable of here. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, let's, what else you got? Um, well, there's uh, we grow a lot of pineapples, so maybe we could show the pineapples this way. So he's taking us over now to his pineapples that he grow a lot of. 
Now, is there something special about your pineapple that, because people can get pineapple, I know it's not the same quality, but right. you can't get abus in a store. You can get pineapples in a store. So what makes you decide to grow so many pineapples? Uh, well, yeah, when you try a, a pineapple grown properly and ripened properly, you'll understand, you know, I'm sure you know that it's nothing like the ones in the store. The pineapples in the store are great for, you know, for what they are and for as, as cheap as they are. But they're picked green and they're sprayed with a, a petroleum-based wax and, and chemical preservatives so that they can last. And they're just hardly edible most of the time. They, they bite you back, you know. Uh, once you have a fully ripened, beautiful pineapple, um, it's just sweet and it melts in your mouth and there's really nothing like it. Now, I heard uh, real pineapple has seeds in it. Is that true? All pineapples have seeds. Yeah, but yeah. the commercial ones, they're so small, you don't really see them. Right? Whoa, look at this. Yeah, so uh, this is our, one of our pineapple patches. One of the things about pineapples is that they ripen from the bottom to the top. So if you have a real big pineapple, it'll start ripening at the bottom, still be green up top. By the time it's ripe at the top, the bottom could be rotten. So we grow a lot of our pineapples in pots to try to keep them small. So when the pineapple ripens, the entire fruit can ripen and, and we don't have to pick it too early where you have most of the pineapple is green. So for example, this, you know, maybe it's less than a pound, about a pound pineapple. Um, it's perfectly yellow, perfectly ripe. There might be a little bit of green at the top, but it's going to be completely sweet the whole way and not rotten at the bottom. So, so for example, so a pineapple in the store is like, whatever, $3. So this high quality pineapple, I know in specialty stores in New York, it would cost a, a tremendous amount of money, but for somebody like me, I want the best. But how much would something like that be? Uh, we, so we sell things by the box on our website. So okay. we might have, a box may have five pineapples, may have three pineapples, depends on the size. Um, and it's probably somewhere around $10 a pound. So give whatever you fit in the box. Okay. Yeah, it's probably somewhere around $10 a pound for pineapples. All right, well, you got me convinced of why you <laughs> sell pineapples. Good deal. And I'm sure the same philosophy with everything here, even though you can get it locally, nothing like getting it like this. Yeah, and, and something that, this is for the growing channel, right? Yes. Uh, so something you guys might find useful is our use of ground cloth. It's not the most pretty, but it is an organic weed suppressant. It allows us to to minimize labor, minimize costs. It's an upfront investment, but something that you might want to consider when planting a garden in your yard, especially in South Florida, um, because you can pop holes in it, like we have with some of these pineapples, and um, and and then you don't have to weed. You can weed very little. Wow. Um, you know, and it, it so the weeds aren't going to get through this. Right. The ground cloth. You know, if you get enough leaf litter on the ground, then yes, they'll start growing on the soil on top, uh, but it's been very, very good for us to cut down on weed whacking and hand pulling and pulling weeds and a lot of people just give up and then start spraying weeds. And know? how much room do you have to leave around the trees when you use the cloth? Um, it's, you really don't need much, but um, we can, we put our manure and we just shove it right underneath the cloth every month or every two months and feed the plants that way. Is that a sermon cherry? This is, uh, okay. well, that's, that's actually some peppers that we use for, I just use for cooking. And this is a uh, reticulata. I know. Okay. All right, so, oh, we can show the, um, the greenhouse. Sure. So what about, uh, I know we're in mango season. Uh, how many varieties of mangoes do you have here? Uh, I don't grow many mangoes. Um, I do have a few varieties that are uh, very special that I can't talk about. <laughs> um, but I'm allergic to mango sap, so I don't like growing mangoes. Very interesting. Do a lot of people uh, request them, or mangoes are are a good item? Um, we'll see what happens in the future. But right now, we we do move a lot of mangoes. So this is the uh, the propagation station. Lots of seedlings and grafts and um, experiments going on in here. Wow! And you built this room here. Wow, so seedlings and do you put your own potting soil together or do you get a commercial one or what do you do? Um, it's a little bit of a mix of everything. We, we reuse everything that we have. If we ever have you know, bump up plants or transplant, we always reuse the soil. Um, 
we have uh, manure, local manure coming from the racetrack, um, and uh, and then just reusing all the soil we get, and and sometimes buying some mixes for the seedlings, like a pro mix type of mix with some perlite. Um, but we. Not Pretty much at this point, we end up recycling everything together and just using it. Now, when you use horse manure, if somebody's going to use horse manure, is it important to know what the horses are fed or not really? Does the GMOs and the well, horse food get through? You know, the, the horse, I don't know enough to say, but the horse manure we get is 95% wood shavings because they're, they're right down the street, the horse track. So um, they change the bedding for the horses every day. It's more like horse piss than anything. Uh, because it's just wood shavings and a day's worth of whatever the horse let out. Sure. So, sure. um, it's more like mulch for us, but it does have some of those nutrients from, from the horses and it's, you know, kind of the most environmentally friendly because if we don't use that, that product, it just goes to the landfill where it produces a lot of methane and doesn't help anyone. So, uh, we get to use that. We, we pay for the transportation and that way, um, we can take something that, you know, would harm the ozone, would harm the planet, and put it into the soil and make something beneficial. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Very impressive here. Do you have more than one greenhouse or is this the main one? This is our only greenhouse right now. Okay. And besides selling fruit, do you sell trees at all? We sell a few trees. Um, I, I'm not ready to go into the tree business, but because we had to start our own nursery due to the pandemic, I do have a lot of extra trees. Um, and so we are selling some of the some of the more choice selections. Alright, so we've got some mame over here growing. And he's got a whole bunch of what are these mulberries? Yes, mulberries. mulberries. A lot of bananas because Bill Assad was here. <laughs> so you have a lot of bananas left over from him? Um actually only like one or two bananas left over from him. Uh-huh. So you got a bunch of different varieties of bananas? Uh, yes. So we, so we have a, uh, a lot of new varieties that we're testing the the viability here. Not every banana produces well here, um, and so uh, yeah, we we have a, a handful of really cool prospects. Now, I see there's a lot of gravel here on the ground, mm -hmm. but that new property you have over there is mostly grass. Was uh, that split at one point, or was it always one property? I well, know you uh, had this it, first. It, 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 it was bo they both belonged to Bill Lassard, but um, yeah, this is, the, this is the division of the two parcels. And this, this gravel is for us to move trucks around, and it's kind of a driveway for us. Um, so this is our, our high density trellis system. It's completely hurricane proof and uh, it should um, increase the yield by about double the a normal traditional planting, maybe more we hope. Um, and so as we're trialing the new species to see if, if the genetics are favorable in this, in this climate, we're also trialing uh, a trellis system that should allow for higher yields and higher production per acre, um, which is also something that we would need here if people are going to be growing into the future and producing fruit in the future. Um, we need to bring, bring down the cost of fruit per acre, and, uh, and, and the only way to do that is to produce more per acre and produce higher value. Um, crops per acre. Now, did you invent this system yourself here, or is this something you found uh, somebody else doing no, successfully? No, this is, this is a, a standard uh, V trellis, Tatura trellis, that's used uh, all over the world for, usually for apples and stone fruits. Um, we are adapting it for tropicals, so it's a slightly different setup. Uh, but, but in essence, the, the goal of this is to produce a higher yield and to be hurricane proof. So our you know, a hurricane can come through and we could still be harvesting fruit the next day. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it won't blow the fruit off the tree? 
It may blow somewhere <laughs> off the tree, but we'll have to see. You know, this is uh, an experiment. Now, I see a lot of the ground is uh, on hills here. So are you not burying directly in the ground? Are you building it up? Is that that because there's water that stands here? Or? Right. After a hurricane, as even the tropical storm we had, I'm sure if you watch Only in Dade, you'll see what happened here. Um, the, you know, the water, the water pools here for days or even weeks. And so if you don't mound up, you risk losing your, your trees. Um, they can just drown if, if there's a lot of rain. And then being in an agricultural zone, if there's going to be a place that gets flooded and canals are going to overflow and dams are going to let loose, it's probably going to be here first. Um, so it's just, a, in my mind, a wise thing to do to um, invest more and, and have the trees higher up. And uh, in the case of flooding and pooling and excess water, which we're almost guaranteed here in my mind. Sure, sure. And uh, so this is still relatively new because I see there's not a lot of things. Right. This is uh, just planted a couple months ago. And uh, this is all new species as we talked about. So each row is a different species and they're all um, top secret because once we have proof of concept, we'll work with a, a single grower for each variety to produce a, a high value crop. Wonderful. That's great. So you're going to take some of the trees from here and bring them to that grower that you're working with? We'll propagate them, yes. Oh, great, so great. either air layer, a graft, or some of them, in some cases, seedlings. Great, great. Cool. Well, this place is amazing, and I've been seeing them online for a long time. MiamiFruit.org. .org. I thank you for your service of what you're doing of helping uh, the local growers and helping people like me who eat a raw <laughs> vegan diet get some great tropical fruit. It's I wish been my pleasure. when I was growing up and, and, and younger and uh, getting into the raw foods, I would have, there were places like this, but... Uh, but now you're here to help new people. It's so. my pleasure, and we hope to continue serving and providing the best quality fruit. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Great. Okay, everybody. So here I am with these fruits that I got from Miami Fruit. They were so kind to give them to me, but you can get these right now on their web website. They're called Granadilla. And this is just an example of the exclusive fruits that they have that you really can't find anywhere else. So it's like a form of a passion fruit. And uh, it, other than the color, it just feels and looks just like a passion fruit. Uh, but it's much sweeter than a passion fruit because the passion fruits are kind of bitter and sour. Uh, so they break open here. And I've had these before. I just love them. They look exactly like a passion fruit on the inside. But they're sweet. They're just like a passion fruit. You're going to seed out that. So good. Picture the sweetest passion fruit with no sour or bitterness at all. These are amazing. So every season, what's in season, you could find on their website all the different things. And they have a list of what's in season and when. So I'm really glad I finally got out there to Miami Fruit. They're doing something that no one else is doing and uh, making this available. Uh, and that the, when I say that is there are other places that you can get fruit from online But they usually have an exclusive uh, of one type of fruits, but Miami fruit just about has everything Because they work with the local growers and they go to all the different farms not just one farm that might specialize in one thing So if you're looking for one thing and you go to those one farms, that's wonderful but if you're looking for a, a wider selection Miami Fruit's doing the work for you by going to all those other farms and making that available to you.